the idea of, of this morning is to uh, uh, sort of give you an overview of what, our, what are our tools available at the bedside to try and minimize uh, the ventilator-induced lung injury, uh, working not just on, on uh, tidal volume, as I will uh, uh, start my lecture on, but also on other parameters. And uh, as it was mentioned yesterday from Dr. Merca, perhaps uh, we feel like this uh, issue of ventilator-induced lung injury is a little bit overstressed in courses and conferences and many people say well we do not see that many RDS patients but in fact in fact the rules that uh, uh, apply to ventilation in RDS are also um, valid in most of the patients with acute hypoxemic respiratory failure and we do see many of those patients in, in our ICU. So I think the, the mental framework we, um, we obtain from RDS patients really very much applies to many of the patients we work on daily in our ICUs. My conflict of interest, and, and uh, you should uh, be aware of the fact that I do have some uh, conflict of interest with uh, uh, the company supporting this uh, uh, symposium. So it has been mentioned yesterday by Dr. Mackay, a very nice half hour talk on the mechanisms uh, causing ventilator-induced lung injury. You had that uh, very comprehensive overview yesterday, which I'm trying to summarize here in one slide. And basically, to make a, a long story very short, I think the mechanisms by which mechanical ventilation may injure the lungs are these two, right? are the distension of alveoli which are already ventilated, which are already opened, and which do receive a tidal volume which is excessive in relation to their size, or the presence of areas of heterogeneity in the lung that uh, do undergo cyclic opening and closing, or uh, of the alveoli, you see here closed at end expiration and closed at end inspiration, or that are stretched because one part is not ventilated and the other part uh, is ventilated. And so uh, these alveoli here are sort of anchored, if you wish, to this floor and they are excessively uh, stretched at each tidal breath. So how can we deal with this very heterogeneous, very stiff uh, and difficult to ventilate lung? The first point is of course tidal volume and I think if the RDS network got one cent, one dollar cent by every time this slide was shown they would have enough money to run the uh, trials for the next 20 years. Uh, still, we uh, have this, this rule that we should really try and aim with a tidal volume of 6 milliliters per kilo ideal body weight. This is our standard point, should be the basic practice. And again, nowadays many ventilators do make this calculation for you, so they are requesting you the, sec the gender of the patient, the height of the patient, and the ventilator will calculate for you the uh, 6 ml per kilo. Still, if you are at the bedside, I think a thumb rule which I, I tend personally to use is, is this formula, okay, Wh which is uh, uh, height minus 100 uh, uh, for men and uh, height mm, minus 110 for women and I'm really pleased to say that uh, as of uh, three days uh, I'm exactly on my ideal body weight. Uh, the scale says I'm exactly on my ideal body weight so I, was, I, I think this formula is very nice. Uh, wh why do I always show this formula? Uh, because there is a much more complex formula if you read the RDS network paper, but again, I think from a pragmatic standpoint, it is better maybe to work with something which it's just in our minds and we do not have to go and look for, uh, but uh, that uh, still provides a very reliable value that we can use. This is also the other important message. I work in an ICU which is a referral center for ARDS. We are supposed to be experts on uh, managing mechanical ventilation in patients with ARDS. Centers call us to manage these patients. And not me, but really my colleagues are really excellent doctors. But if I open the medical records of these patients in 50% of them, the height of the patient is not charted. So I think 
measuring the height of the patient is the necessary ingredient to start and then we can reason on which formula we want to have. But, but really, measuring the height might seem obvious, but still, it's something we, we forget to do or we do not chart it or we go like, uh, it should be 180. So all male patients in our SU look like they are 180. Uh, the fact that, and, and I think this is a paradigm which is a bit changing, but for time being, for time being, the information that we have is that if, pla hey, ciao. if plateau pressure is low, this does not allow us to use non-protective tidal volumes. So this is a paper by, by Hager, it's a reanalysis of uh, um, the RDS network study that shows that uh, uh, if you compare patients managed with uh, conventional ventilation, for whatever that means, versus protective ventilation, the mortality of patients treated with protective ventilation is lower uh, than the mortality, uh, irrespective, sorry, of whether their plateau pressure was low or was high. So the fact that the plateau pressure is 20, 25, it's in a protective range, is not a good reason to use non-protective tidal volume. And really, as also Alan said yesterday, I think there's really little argument for not applying 6 ml per kilo ventilation in patients with acute hypoxemic respiratory failure unless they have an obstructive disease. But if they have hypoxemia, low compliance, I think it, it really makes sense to try and stick to this 6 ml per kilo, which of course will require an increase in respiratory rate. Uh, having said that, I think what, what we know on, on tidal volume is, is uh, uh, rather uh, straightforward and, uh, so I have the time there, yeah, uh, rather straightforward, rather well known, so I will just move on to plateau and transpulmonary pressure. Why is it important to measure plateau pressure? Well, of course, it is important because it is a marker of, of severity. Um, if, you, if we take a look at the lung safe data, we still see, however, that uh, many of the investigators who are taking care of patients with the RDS uh, did not measure or at least did not chart plateau pressure. <coughs> so if we just look at the population of patients treated with the controlled ventilation, so uh, patients in whom a plateau pressure can be obtained for sure, uh, we still see that uh, this was measured or at least charted in only 50% of the patient. And this is perhaps due to the fact that uh, the relevance of, of plateau pressure is not perceived or maybe there is a, a, misbe a misbelief by which um, plateau pressure can be measured only during uh, volume controlled ventilation and so forth. But still, uh, the, the importance of measuring plateau pressure, I believe, uh, is, is uh, still a bit neglected. Uh, so going back to the issue of, of plateau pressure as a marker of, of severity of the disease, uh, this paper from, from Hager clearly shows that there is an increase in the mortality uh, rate of our patients at an increase for increasing values of plateau pressure. We also had found <coughs> a similar uh, relationship between the value, uh, the plateau pressure value and the inflammation in the lungs as measured by positron emission tomography, which we uh, have uh, used in uh, 15 RDS patients. And we noticed that there was a, a, a not exactly linear relationship between uh, plateau pressure and the inflammation of the lung. And as you see here, we plotted a, a very light dashed line. It was the uh, heaviest uh, the reviewers would allow us to, to draw, but still we put it there. This is 27 centimeters of, oh, this is, sorry, 26 centimeters of water. And as you can see here, it looks like the inflammation of the lungs increased steeply above 27 centimeters of water, which is just a little bit below the recommended safety threshold. So personally, personally, I think that 
having a plateau pressure of 27 could be safer than 30. And please take this with caution. It comes from a few experimental studies. This is ours. And there is this other study from uh, the uh, group of, of Marco Ranieri. Uh, and again, they found somehow, interestingly, it's totally different studies, totally separate populations, but still quite interestingly, uh, they have shown that the uh, risk of being, uh, uh, of um, receiving uh, over distension is much higher if plateau pressure is above 27 centimeters of water. And then the, the plateau pressure uh, to, to the concept of plateau pressure, it has been recently added the concept of driving pressure. I'm, I'm sure you heard about it. It's, it's becoming very popular and I think I was a bit skeptical on it in the beginning, but then I'm, I'm starting to realize that it's really, really a powerful uh, tool. And why is that? Because we currently scale the tidal volume to the ideal body weight of the patient, okay? That's what we do. Based on the height of the patient, we estimate the uh, ideal body weight. And, and, and the assumption is that the size of the lung is proportional to the height of the patient, which is not an assumption, it is a fact in healthy subjects. So in healthy subjects, the, the, once I know the height of the subject, I roughly know the size of the lung. And so it makes perfect sense to scale tidal volume to the ideal body weight. However, in patients with uh, ARDS, but it's really honestly, I would say hypoxemic respiratory failure, we would like to scale the tidal volume to the size of the lung because we are not ventilating the patients from, you know, from the hair all the way down to the toes, or we hope not. We just ventilate the lungs of the patient. And so we would like to scale the tidal volume to end expiratory lung volume, which is not exactly easy to measure, but we will go back to this in a minute. And, and I'm pointing to driving pressure, but I'm, I, I Take a, I'm taking a slight detour, but this is very important. Now, is this concept of scaling tidal volume to end expiratory lung volume clinically relevant for our patient? It is. This is a study you've seen yesterday by the group done here in, in, in Policlinico from, uh, from, uh, by Alessandro Protti, where he has shown that uh, what really determines the uh, onset, the um, the generation of uh, lung edema, of, uh, 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 sorry, of uh, lesional lung edema, is the ratio of tidal volume to FRC or to end expiratory lung volume, which they have called the strain. So what determines the, the injury is the, uh, once again, the, 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 the ratio of the tidal volume to the volume available for ventilation. You see here, in order to injure the lungs, they went up to very high levels of strain because these are healthy lungs. How does, the, how does this apply to patients with respiratory failure? It does. More or less in the same years we were doing that study I've shown you before on, uh, with positron emission tomography and we measured by CT scan the volume, uh, the tidal volume distending the baby lung and the size of the baby lung. And uh, indeed, well, there was a significant correlation between the ratio of, sorry, of this uh, tidal volume to end expiratory lung volume and the inflammation. So what really matters is the ratio between the, the volume we are using to, to distend the lung and the room that we have in the lung to ventilate them, okay? It's like fitting 10 person in this room or in a uh, room which is one square meter. That's, that's the idea. As said, it's a little bit tricky to measure end expiratory lung volume at the bedside, but we do know from the early study, studies of Gattinoni and Pesenti that compliance is a great surrogate of end expiratory lung volume. The larger the lung, the higher the compliance and vice versa. So instead of measuring end expiratory lung volume, we just 
do measure compliance. We replace end expiratory lung volume with compliance, okay? And if you do a little bit of maths, compliance is tidal volume divided plateau minus PIP, and so basically you are left with driving pressure. This is the reason why driving pressure, it's not a magic number that came out torturing a database and finding what was the best number, the, the best predictor of mortality, okay? Respiratory rate times age uh, square plus SOFA score, okay? This is a number which has a very strong physiologic rationale because it tells us in one number, just one, the ratio of the tidal volume to the end expiratory lung volume. The other reason I, I like driving pressure is that it's easy to measure. You can measure it, as said, in, in uh, volume control, in pressure control, and, and it's just uh, plateau pressure minus PEEP, and as we've seen yesterday, you measure it also during assisted ventilation. The big study showing the importance of, of driving pressure was this done by, by Marcelo Amato and after this study was published, of course, they were very old, uh, not old, sorry, very experienced and respected people that would say, oh yes, we've known that for years, nothing new under the sun and blah, 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 but still, still, this study from, from Marcelo Amato deserves the credit, I think, of, of bringing this, this parameter to the center of the field. So what has he shown? Just to make a long story short, let's look at this plot here. These are groups of patients who have more or less, not more or less, who have exactly the same dry, uh, plateau pressure, okay? Which is, on average, in the safe range. Uh, 28 centimeters of water dry plateau pressure. Same plateau pressure, but this plateau pressure is reached in very different ways. In one group, we start from a very low level of PEEP, say 7, and we add on top of this 23 centimeters of water driving pressure. In, this guy, in these patients here, you start from a high PEEP, 18 centimeters of water, and you get to the same 28, so 10 centimeters of water driving pressure. And look, the first group has a much higher mortality, 30% higher mortality as compared to the controls, and this last group has 30% less mortality. So I'm not saying plateau pressure is not important, but I'm saying is it's not just the value of plateau pressure you reach, it's how you get there that really matters. <coughs> this we can skip. <coughs> Besides being a marker of severity, I think that plateau pressure and driving pressure are really important to guide our uh, ventilatory strategies. And why is that? Uh, because, well, let's go on with the presentation in the regular order. Because I think that the old classic PV curves on which many, many papers were published and nowadays we are lucky enough to have available in, in most machines, tell us, describe the um, uh, mechanical properties of the respiratory system throughout a wide range of pressures. And so we do know that there is a lower inflection point, many times we don't see it, uh, but if there is a lower inflection point, this has been often associated with the presence of uh, uh, recruitment, and so we know that if we keep ventilating here, we will probably cause uh, some atelic trauma. But to me, most importantly, because I oftentimes see it clinically, oftentimes, is the presence of an upper inflection point, okay, which is uh, associated with overdistension and volotrauma. And so if I see a PV loop like this, I don't think that in this patient, it, it is, I have to rearrange it because it's not straight, but basically this would be 30, okay? 30 centimeters of water is here, which is exactly in the area of overdistension. So despite on the book it's written that 30 centimeters of water is a safe plateau pressure, in this patient, this PV loop is telling me 
that 30 centimeters of water plateau pressure is not safe and I should rather go for 25 centimeters of water plateau pressure. So this is, uh, as, as the Romans said, you know, to, uh, we are in Italy, so I, I quote the Romans, they, on the maps, to mark areas in the desert that were dangerous, they would write, hic sunt leones, here are the lions, so beware of going there. And, uh, you know, if you see something like this, hic sunt leones, you do not want to ventilate your patients uh, up there. You can do a, 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 a full PV loop, if you wish. What I normally do is, what we normally do in our clinical practice is when once we titrate PEEP, we always take a look at what happens with to driving pressure. So for example, which is exactly the same of looking at what happens to compliance if you do not change tidal volume. Huh? Uh, so for example, here we start from a PEEP of zero, just for the sake of, an, of the example, and driving pressure is 18. And for a given while, we see that increasing PEEP leads to a decrease in driving pressure, which is likely indicating recruitment of the lung. But at some point, if you keep increasing PEEP, you will start to see that driving pressure goes up again. You climbed your stair, and now you are hitting your head in the roof, and this is where there is over distension, and, and you don't want to ventilate your patient up there. And so if you see something like this, that increasing PEEP, driving pressure increases, you have two options. Either you go back to this PEEP level here, or you uh, choose to decrease, for example, your tidal volume. Uh, I'll skip through this uh, just a bit quickly for the sake of time. And uh, uh, you will have a, a full uh, EIT session tomorrow, but uh, I would like to share with you our uh, approach in this, in this regard, um, how we use uh, EIT to, to titrate PEEP. And uh, uh, I must say that we started to use EIT as a, more as a research tool, but uh, nowadays most, in most patients who are uh, on um, relatively high levels of PEEP, we use EIT clinically to titrate uh, the, the PEEP level. So how can you use EIT to titrate PEEP? You may use it in many, many different ways. There are different softwares, blah, blah, blah. I'll show you what we do. Uh, this is a change in, in, uh, um, in PEEP tracked by EIT. You see tidal volume going in and out, and then there is a PEEP change, and then uh, we see that we reach a new end expiratory lung volume. Now, this could mean two things. Either that we have achieved some lung recruitment, we opened some alveoli, or that we are just distending alveoli which were already opened, okay? How do we dissect between these two phenomena? We used an approach which is based on, uh, let's say, on a um, perturbation of the system induced by a recruitment maneuver. I think recruitment maneuvers uh, are often seen as a treatment or a rescue therapy. I think they are very diagnostic uh, tools. And so, for example, here you have a patient who is ventilated, we give a recruitment maneuver and we go back to the same level of PEEP and we do see, in fact, that for sure we have achieved some recruitment because we went back to the same PEEP level but still there is more air in the lungs and so this cannot be anything but recruitment. But as you see, the PEEP is not able to keep the lung open and we lose all this uh, gain. So, we gave another recruitment, we give another recruitment maneuver and uh, uh, we increase PEEP and then you see that end expiratory lung volume is now, uh, is now stable. And uh, yeah, I brought way too many slides, but this is a paper in which we have shown that uh, this uh, selection is, is feasible and uh, uh, clinically applicable in, in many patients. We have also seen that by increasing PEEP, only a few centimeters of water uh, above 
the level which we had set, we obtain a significant level of overdistension. So always you will get some recruitment, but you will have to pay a price in terms of overdistension. But why am I showing this? Because uh, this to me explains part of the negative findings of the art study. When I, I speak about uh, setting PEEP according to driving pressure, I always show the art study, which is a study that we were all waiting for because it's very rational. We set the PEEP according to the best compliance, it's what we do. Unfortunately, this uh, study showed harm in the patients treated with this approach, but the investigator decided to look for the best compliance and then set the PEEP two centimeters above, which by definition will be associated with some degree of overdistension. And so I believe that uh, the art study does not really kill the meaning of uh, uh, and the value of setting and uh, sorry, um, PEEP on uh, uh, driving pressure. Uh, to finish, I would like to spend a few words on, on transpulmonary pressure and just to uh, state that when we speak about transpulmonary pressure, which is now getting back on the field, uh, great interest, uh, we have to make sure first that we speak the same language and what you read in the paper is what you're doing in your ICU because really here the approaches are very different. So there is one first if I may say sim simple approach, which is just take the end expiratory lung vol uh, um, sorry, the, the end expiratory pressure in the airways and the in the esophagus, so in the around the, 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 the lung in the chest wall, and subtract them. So airway pressure minus esophageal pressure. In this case, it would be uh, 7.1 minus 7.6 minus 0 0.5 and some authors suggest that you should try and keep this pressure positive so you should be increasing the PEEP until the end expiratory transpulmonary pressure is positive uh, and as you know, uh, there was a first positive study with this approach, but then uh, these data are not that uh, uh, obvious uh, anymore. So, uh, another approach is based on measuring the differences, the transpulmonary pressure changes induced by tidal ventilation. So, we start from a given value, we end up with another value, we start from PEEP, we end up to plateau by insufflating this tidal volume and so we are able to measure the total pressure of the respiratory system, the delta in the airway pressure, the um, esophageal pressure, sorry here, the esophageal pressure swing and so the transpulmonary pressure which is caused by the tidal volume. And Basically, this is uh, allowing us to know how much of this total, let's say, 35, no, sorry, 35 is too much. We have a driving pressure of uh, 15 centimeters of water. How much of this is spent on the chest wall, which is the delta esophageal pressure, and how much is this is spent on the lungs? My time is finished, so uh, to conclude, <coughs> You know, I'm, I'm very fond of, of monitoring during mechanical ventilation. Plateau and driving pressure are not just indicator of patient severity, while this patient is very sick, mm, sorry about that, but they also provide us information that can help uh, treatment guidance. And, whoops, I pushed the right button. And I think with esophageal pressure, we have to be aware of the fact that uh, different approaches lead to very different results uh, and so each unit should decide which approach is best there and get familiar with one and establish how to use this into the patient management workflow. I thank you very much for your attention.